<laughs> well, hello. I don't think I have to add any welcome to Anthony after that. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, but welcome yourselves to the 2011 Sydney Writers' Festival. My name is Jill, do you play? And I'd like to welcome you to Medium Raw, which is in conversation with Anthony. Uh, in fact, it's going to be a bit of a grill, so we'll probably get to a, a Medium Raw sort of situation fairly quickly, I think. And I'm hoping too that it's going to be well done. I'd also like to thank our event sponsor, <laughs> Middleton's law firm for their support of the festival and in particular this session and I'd like their top libel people to be on red alert if that's okay in the corners and please wish me luck too because Mr Baudin tweeted on Thursday that the last moderator was somewhat of a slow motion colonoscopy. <laughs> A little bit of housework, mobile phones and pages off, please, we don't care who needs you. Yes, there will be a Q&A at the end of the session. No, there will be no tastings. And Tony will be signing his book after the session, which is the very reason we are here, after all, the book. And books and writing and reading. I was looking for a very quick introduction to Anthony for you, and I found the most ideal one online existing on the Urban Dictionary, and I quote, Anthony Bourdain, noun, adjective. Anthony Bourdain is an author, chef, and television host. This is ironic because he is also Satan. <laughs> he is one of the baddest motherfuckers to grace television. <laughs> His books are well-written, conscious, and can be quite humorous. His restaurant, Les Isles, serves amazing French cuisine and is located in New York. Ladies and gentlemen, Anthony Bourdain. <laughs> I'm not sure who's going to have as much, <laughs> that much fun up here. I think it's going to be me. Um, okay, you wrote your first book, Kitchen Confidential, in the year 2000. And it hit the New York Times bestseller list, and you followed that with a cook's tour with the nasty bits, with crime novel, with TV shows. And now this latest book, Medium Raw, is a sequel, in effect, to Kitchen Con Confidential, 10 years on, part expose, part memoir, tracking life since leaving the kitchen. How have you changed in that last 10 years? Well, when I wrote Kitchen Confidential, I was a completely broke, uh, stressed out, 44-year-old, working as he had always worked his entire life in a... In a not particularly great or famous uh, uh, restaurant kitchen. You know, standing next to a deep fryer, I'd, you know, I'd never had health insurance. I'd never owned a car. I'd never paid my rent on time. I owed that. I, I hadn't filed my taxes in ten years. I was a frightened, angry, uh, desperate character who who'd seen almost nothing of the world uh, outside of kitchens. Mm. You know, it's ten years later. 11 years later, I, I've, I've had almost 10 years of the best job in the world traveling around. I go anywhere I want. I stay in a lot of nice hotels. I've eaten in some of the best restaurants in the world. I'm friends with a lot of the greatest chefs. Um, I've seen life high and low. Uh, I've, I've lived a life of incredible, almost overnight from who I was back then. My life changed so drastically. Uh, and, and maybe, mo you know, I'm older. I don't know that I'm wiser. Uh, but I've seen a hell of a lot more that I never thought I would have seen. I've become corrupted by the process in the sense that I, I, I've become, you know, one of those TV characters that I, you know, had no understanding for at all when I was in the kitchen. And maybe the largest difference, you know, I'm a daddy now. You know, I have a four-year-old mm. little girl at home. And that's, uh, you know, all the cliches about parenthood are, are, of course, absolutely true. So the, one of the big changes is, of course, your... You were a chef and now you're a celebrity. And I don't work for a living. I mean... <laughs> you're making it sound good. I mean, writing, I, I have no sympathy for anyone fortunate enough to get paid any kind of money to write, whining about writer's block or how hard it is or some sort of internal torture. You're doing it in a sitting position. So right away, 
you know, I spent my whole adult life on my feet. I feel very, very lucky that anybody even gives a shit what I think. Mm. It's not something I'm used to, and, and the privil it is a privilege to be able to write and have even eight people care what you're saying. Mm. There's a great line in Medium Raw where you said being a heroin addict was fantastic preparation for being a celebrity. Yeah. <laughs> Could you please explain? Well, particularly in the world of television, uh, but it's also true, I think, in any media. There are a lot of people out there who are full of shit. Um, they, you know, people will tell you, especially in Hollywood, you know, they're telling me, we, you know, we love your work, we, you know, we really want to work with you, we're terribly excited about this new project, all of those things. You know, when you're a junkie, it is necessary that you very quickly, you know, because you're desperate, you, you, you only have $10 and you need to get well with it, and you're buying it on the street for some pretty hardcore characters who are also, you're surrounded by hustlers mm. with a real imperative to hustle, you just develop a sort of a sixth sense you become a pretty good judge of character. Are, is this person reliable, or are they full of shit? Are they the sort of person who is going to do what they say they're going to do? And, and you develop this almost feral sense, uh, which I think is true of chefs as well. You look into someone's eyes and you ask yourself, are there, you, know, you believe there are only two types of people in this world. They're the type of people who say they're going to do something tomorrow, and they actually do it, and then there's everybody else. And having been a heroin addict, you, you have to develop that, that, that at least some skills uh, as far as judging which type of person that might be you're dealing with, or, or you end up dead or, well, not, you, mm. you, you, don't, you don't end up on the street very long. Mm. Do you think that's why you were drawn to the kitchen or to the restaurant industry in the first place, to get some sort of structure? I, I think it, I, fell it, I fell into the business accidentally. Uh, but I, it was certainly the only time in my life that I responded well to any kind of structure. I was, I was grateful for it. It was the first time that I went home with any reason to be proud of myself. It was the first time that I cared about anybody else's uh, opinion of me. Uh, it was uh, the first time I respected myself or anybody else. I, I definitely, it was a, a, a perfect mix of romance and, you know, piratical attitudes and sex and drugs and rock and roll. That's true, but, but you're absolutely right. It was that structure. It was the first hierarchy and, and structure and quantifiable, you know, uh, uh, organization uh, and, and system of value system that, 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 that I, I recognized that I needed it and I was mm. grateful for it. And I... Uh, um, I liked it, obviously. I fell in love with the life long before I started to get serious about food. Mm. But it's that anger, isn't it, that, that you brought to your writing, in a way, and that, that's what made the writing so compelling, uh, because it was very short, very direct, very short order, in a way, very direct, um, very no bullshit about your life, and your life was... A, you had a lot of coffee. A lot of hyperbole. Um, you know, in the kitchen, uh, as a chef, when you're angry at a cook or a waiter, they are, for the moment, the worst, most miserable rat bastard on earth. But five minutes later, I love you, I want to bury your children, you know, you're the greatest human being who ever worked, walked the earth. Mm. Um, those feelings can coexist or change pretty, pretty, pretty quickly. But... You know, I am angry. Um, uh, the, the, clearly, that fuels me. Um, but I, I like to think that, that, like a number of other authors I can think of, you know, the, the flip side of that is a sense of, of, of spoiled romanticism, a disappointment with the way the world turned out. You know, it was supposed to be far more beautiful and romantic and, and gentle. And, 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 you know, I learned pretty early on it wasn't going to be like that. And, mm. um, and how you punish people. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it doesn't make everything better to, you know, uh, uh, to, to, to insult somebody, but it, it, it helps. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to throw you another question about this whole celebrity chef caper, because it is so much a part of our world at the moment. Um, and we had Marco Pierre White in town this week. You described him the other night as an icon, an iconic figure in our gastronomic universe. And yet here he was in Australia, 
flogging continental stock cubes, um, and which broke my heart because I fell in love with him when he was so um, the, the beginning of the iconic. He was the hottest young chef I'd ever seen in my life, and his food was just so beautiful, and his head was in a very great place. But he was, he's a fucked up character too. Um, well, we all are. Uh, well, I mean, we anyone all who are. Cooks, yes, so. we are. We are. Um, but I found that a bit depressing. I mean, he's probably thinking he's good, doing good business, and he's running around the world and doing all that. But do you think? That that is the trajectory of someone Why who should we hold high? chefs? Cooking is hard. It's yeah. really hard. It breaks you down. You, chefs used to, lifespan used to be, until the 30s, was 37 years old. It is now about 57. Why do we demand or insist or expect chefs to die behind the stove, broken-ass, flat-footed, varicose-veined at 57? Why do we hold chefs to a, to a higher standard than, than Keith Richards or Iggy <laughs> or or anyone else who's incredibly cool and changed the world. Uh, you know, Marco here, what I would compare him to Orson Welles. Orson Welles made Citizen Kane. If he wants to end up making commercials for bad wine, good for him. I wish he'd been paid more money for it. He still made the greatest goddamn movie in American history to that point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, he changed the world for the better. Marco has done his good works. What I admire about Marco in particular is that he reached the mountaintop. He got three stars earlier than just, I think, anyone else in the world had ever done it. An, yeah. an Englishman who'd yeah, never did. been to France cooking French food, and he didn't want it anymore. He gave his stars back and said, I don't, I, it's, I've done my thing. I want to spend my days cashing checks and walking around in the English countryside shooting animals. And, <laughs> and, and you know what? God bless him. Yeah. Who, who better deserves to sell out any way they want, make a little money in their old age than chefs? Okay, but. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I'll say this. I, I feel a lot better about Marco Pierre White cashing paychecks now for whatever he may do than Paris Hilton getting paid for anything. It's true. You have to do it. However, where do you draw the line? Do you have a personal line in the sand uh, that you will not cross? Or is there some level um, of behavior that you go, that chef can do this, can do that, can flog bad wine, etc. Is there a line where you okay. go, I we give all up have a, we, we, well, uh, I'll, let's make it personal. I, uh, there is a line for me. Uh, you know, Olive Garden or Kentucky Fried Chicken. Or, you know, I would have a very hard time personally standing there saying this food is really delicious when I know it's crap. Um, I, I mean, I personally so do lying. not. lying. I personally, no, I'm happy to lie. I, I, oh. <laughs> It is, not a, it is not a, for, uh, to be honest, it is not an integrity issue with me, it is a vanity issue. It is strictly, <laughs> I don't care how much money in the world, I will just, I've had plenty, I know what it's like to wake up in the morning and be ashamed of what I did yesterday, and I, I don't like that feeling, it's just, I don't want to look in the mirror and see, you know, the, you know, the, uh, the Olive Garden, the TGI Friday guy. I just, I, it's vanity. It, it, it doesn't have anything to do with integrity. Um, okay. Okay, my um, my line for that is that what against if they cross that I lose sight of them. The point of no return, going on Dancing with the Stars. Ah, well I've been offered twice. Offered twice. Twice. Yeah. I Again, mean, probably a vanity issue. Yeah, I mean I'm not going on celebrity rehab yet either. <laughs> but but you know, talk to me in ten years. You know, I mean I'm doing well now. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> you know? And I will. Okay, as a chef, uh, what's your idea of the customer from hell? The customer from hell, the worst customer on earth is the customer who's decided beforehand. They're already miserable the minute they walk in the door. Mm -hmm. And they've decided that they're going to feel better if they bully, uh, speak condescendingly to, or mistreat floor staff. This is an unforgivable act to me. I mean, you... If we go out to lunch together and you're rude to your waiter and treat them like a piece of shit, talk down to them, or blame them for the kitchen's mistakes, we will never, our relationship is dead and will always be dead. Um, that sort of just, you know, person working through personal issues, uh, who's, they're not there to, to, to relax, get a little drunk, and, and let things happen, have a meal. They're, they're just a miserable person who would probably bring that same misery 
to ruin every experience, mm. whether it's a musical performance uh, or the, the food, a dinner, or the sex act. <laughs> Quite. And do you have an idea of a chef from hell? The chef from hell is the chef who, who's, who's been broken and just doesn't care. You know, they have no pride. They're unhappy. They, 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 don't, they don't like their customers. They don't like their owner. Uh, they, they don't care whether their customers are happy anymore. They've, I've been there. Mm. You know, uh, you just, you know, all pride is gone. You know, a heartbroken chef is the, is the chef from hell because almost all of them start out wanting to make good food. And for many, many years, you were punished for that. You know, you, if you dare to try to serve food the way you knew it to be great and that you'd had it in France or the way, you, you know, your training had taught you, you're, you'd get slapped down by the customer. You know, there's still blood in this steak. Tuna, oh, that's for cats. You know, uh, you know squid, it's, ooh, it's ooky. Uh, fish is oily and dark. You know, these were very much the, the, the common attitudes back in the 70s and 80s. So it's... You know, I think it's been a good side effect of this, you know, admittedly annoying celebrity chef phenomena is that people actually give a shit what the chef thinks now mm. and are willing to, to give them a shot. Um, but, but the one who's out there toiling, just kind of slopping it out and doesn't really care, that's the chef from hell. Mm. And is there such a thing as a novelist or a writer from hell for you? Um, I, I don't know. I... I, I I don't really know many writers. I don't hang out with writers. I mm. don't, I mean, you know, ask yourself, you're on a lifeboat adrift in the sea about to wash up on an island. Which would you prefer to be marooned on an island with a bunch of cooks or a bunch of writers? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I enjoy a good book as much as, if not more than anybody, but, but writers? I have mixed emotions. <laughs> okay, well, related to that, I guess, uh, restaurant critics. You've um, been, you've said a few mean things about restaurant critics in your day. Well, in general, it is a degraded profession. I, I, I don't, I mean, I've known a lot of bent, you know, you said in the, in the dressing room, there are venal sins versus... Or... Well, Anthony got into a bit of trouble for calling restaurant critics corrupt. And I actually said, I don't know, I've never met any restaurant critics that are yeah, venally, financially corrupt, but I have met some who are what I'd call socially corrupt, um, so that they do have relationships with chefs, right. restaurateurs. So there, there's, a, there's a difference. First of all, there are plenty of food writers I know, uh, the, the New York Times critic, year after year after year, they make ex ex go to extraordinary measures to insulate themselves from the, the swamp. Mm. Um, Certainly, Jonathan Gold uh, is a hero of mine. Um, you know, a lot of people who, I think a lot of people offhand who, who I would exclude from that description. But there are those who, I mean, I know food critics also, who demand free vacations, for instance. I would like a free vacation in the Caribbean for my wife and myself, for, they're demanding from the subjects of their reviews. But imagine, you know, I'd like, I'd like, you know, I'd really like a five day vacation. You understand you're working with a hotel in the Caribbean, you know? You know, my wife and I would really enjoy a, a week down there, all expenses paid with bungalow and free room service. You know, can you, you arrange that? Are you talking about anyone in particular? Mm, that's just hypothetically speaking. You're, you have, but <laughs> your libel laws here, I think, is libel tourism, right? You, know, you can sue yeah. if you get a bad review, so I'm going to leave that alone. Um, there are people who, back in the day, and some of these characters are still around, who I can well remember shaking restaurateurs down for cash. And then, but much more common, are the people who become corrupted by what is inevitably a corrupting process. If I were a, I would, it would be impossible for me to be a food critic, okay? I, all my friends are chefs. I am, I am, uh, I've been compromised by my personal relationships with these chefs over the year. My, my, my palate has become corrupted because unlike most of you, I've eaten at El Bulli a lot. I've eaten at Robuchon. I've, to me, a 12 course tasting menu at one of the great restaurants in the world is, is often a burden. I'm bored with truffles. What kind of <laughs> critical ability can I, you know, what, what can I say that is meaningful to an ordinary person when I've lost my sense, to, uh, my ability to be delighted by things that, that to most others would be a once in a lifetime an incredible experience. But the most common form of corruption is, of course, just like uh, reporters, well, you know, White House correspondents. You know, you, and it, it's, the pressure is on uh, food writers 
you know, I don't want to write about, you know, my favorite lemon meringue pie every week. I don't want to write muffin recipes. I want to go to restaurants and live a good life and write interesting things. In order to do that, I need access. I need people in that life to tell me things. Now, these people have their own interest, which is I want food critics to, to write good things about me. So I'm going to send you a few extra snacks. I'm going to take you for a little private tour of my kitchen. You're going to have, we'll have special little candlelight meals together. We'll I'll preview my new menu. You know, maybe I'll give you a back rub. You know, invite you over to my house. You know, at the end of the day, you're going to be less likely to say anything bad about me. Um, it, you know, there's a popular food guide in New York. It's the, the industry standard. Every high-end restaurant in New York buys them by the tens of, by the, by the thousands, five, six thousand copies of this guide. And if they don't buy five or six this year, they get a call saying, how come you're not buying as many? Well, I wasn't, you know, you, know, you were kind of, you weren't so nice to me this year. That's okay, we'll fix it. That ain't right, you know? Uh, so it is, it is a, it is a when, when a journalist needs access and the only access they're going to get and the only, basically the, 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 they're very, especially when they're not getting paid to eat at these restaurants a lot, they don't have much, as much of a budget as, say, the Times to go out to fine dining restaurants. Man, they, they rely on their subjects uh, to, to, to give them good stuff, um, whether that's money or free food or extra courses, but more often than not, just access. And if they don't get it, some of them tend to get cranky, and, and then there's payback involved. So it's, I, I don't think it's necessarily the most evil thing in the world, but I think it's useful if you're writing about food, and certainly if you're critiquing food, you know, maybe there should be term limits. Term limits. Yeah, you know, meaning after five years, you should gracefully move on to some other mm -hmm. sector because you've, you've, you've been swimming in the same sort of room, blood temperature, hot tub for a long time. Something's going to, you're going to catch something. <laughs> 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 well, I suppose the restaurant critic is in a position between the restaurant industry, the chef, the kitchen, and us, the diners, and is just trying to um, explain one to the other a little bit in many ways and that is your unique position as well because as a chef you know what's going on out there and yet as a writer you're at the front many times observing quite rigorously what's going on one story in medium raw my favorite that is simply a morning in the life of a fish filleter in a restaurant in new york called le bernardin the fish comes in in the morning this guy's got his knives he fillets the fish, he places it in the way it, the chefs want it, ready to go for their lunch. That's it, that's the entire story. But it's actually, had a chef written it, with all the, uh, the knowledge of what had to go down, it could still be boring. If a, a writer, a journalist, a rigorous observer had written it, it could still be boring. But somebody who, if, who can fuse those two things with, uh, with respect, so much respect was coming off the pages about this guy because he's so good at what he does. Thousand pounds of fish this guy cleans yeah. in four hours every day. Off the bone and into perfect three-star Michelin uh, portions. It takes three trained sous chefs all day long, seven hours. Three of them working together to replace this guy when he goes on vacation. But this is a perfect example. I would never been able to write that. I never would have had access to this guy. I never would have known about him had I not been best friends with Eric Repair mm. and, and, and been in this weird, compromised... The, the, the very thing that allowed me to write that was the fact that I should never be trusted to, 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 to be a critic of, of, of a restaurant. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I live in a half world, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Between heaven and hell, there's a chaos. Life is good. <laughs> I like my job. I like the Urban Dictionary because they went on to say, on his TV shows, he's known for eating way too much, yet being tall and skinny, smoking excessively, so this was written a few years ago, and getting drunk most everywhere he goes. He can also be extremely obnoxious and arrogant when doing any of these three things. <laughs> but you, you're not, are you? I can be... I, You're not. He's been so well mannered. We're all so disappointed. <laughs> um, I can be. I can be really obnoxious. 
Yeah, um, but you're not exactly biting the heads off chooks or screwing well, the waitress over the hot grill. You know, that's so last week, you know. Uh, it's, <laughs> I, I mean, I'm uh, older now, on. you know. I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, first of all, I'm the father of a little girl. That, that means a lot to me, you know. I'm not going to apologize for my previous life. It, that's what daddy was, that's what daddy did. But I'm very, I don't want her reading, you know, terrible shit about me on the internet, behaving badly to women, for instance. That would, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. Um, you know, the, I was referred to when Kitchen Confidential came out as a bad boy chef. Now, I was 44 years old when that book came out. <laughs> so already it was ludicrous. I never really took it, took it that seriously. Um, and I'm certainly not that bad. I'm certainly not a boy. And I'm not even a chef anymore. But, but I'm, one of the reasons I wrote this book is to kind of correct that impression. Or, or, mm -hmm. But I, I think I've benefited very much from the fact that Kitchen Confidential was so over-testosterone and so obnoxious. Uh, that because that it was written... I didn't think anyone would read it outside of the restaurant business. So it was written for the consumption and entertainment of my fry cook, essentially. That's the only person I could imagine ever buying a copy. So it was intended <laughs> to be entertaining and amusing to a very tiny group of people who were working in New York restaurants. And the tone reflected that. It would, it would sound softer and more familiar to them. But I benefited from, you know, because the book was so obnoxious, people are surprised when I could eat with a knife and fork and not... <laughs> bark obscenities, you know, indiscriminately, uh, mm. at least. Uh, you know, I, I benefit very much from low expectations. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, the voice in all the books is very strong. Were you born with that voice? Is this your natural voice? Do you write as you speak, speak as you write? Or did you have early influences? Did you have something to model yourself on? Um, I'm going to tell you something that you know, aspiring writers and writers here will really hate me for. I've never written anything in my life that hasn't been published. I yeah, we have never, yeah. never toiled away in a garret for years writing unsuccessful or unpublished manuscripts. Uh, if I had a, you know, I wrote the article that Kitchen Confidential was based on for a free paper in New York. I figured that was, you know, they were lame enough to buy my piece. It ended up in the New Yorker. I mean, I got, mm. I, I, I got lucky. I, I've always talking, telling stories, uh, being a little provocateur with a way with words was something that was true of me when I was a little kid. I've always used that skill to uh, get the things I want, to manipulate events to my liking to get myself into trouble, to get myself out of trouble, to hurt my enemies, to seduce people who I, you know, or make people, you know, do things that I want, would, would like them to do. So I was, I was always, a, uh, you know, my parents very early on said, you know, you should really be a lawyer, you know, he's, he's got such a way with words. Um, <laughs> I write like I talk, uh, but yeah, I pretty much, yeah, I've always been like this. Right. If there were influences, writing influences, who really turned on the light for me, um, I always did read a lot. Um, certainly, you can hear Hunter Thompson in my writing. When I was, I think, 12 years old, I opened Rolling Stone magazine, and, and where they were serializing uh, what then became Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, mm -hmm. and that clicked for me. Yeah. His, his rage, that, that someone could write, could, 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 could put into words the way I felt, this bitter disappointment with the way the 60s turned out. Uh, uh, I just the, the the hyperbole, uh, the the lush, violent language, uh, the humor. Uh, clearly, that was uh, an influence. But but he was and maybe not the best role model for a twelve year old. Uh, I sought to emulate him in all ways, but actually writing. You know, I just figured maybe if I take a lot of drugs for the next thirty years, I'll I'll be able to write like that. Um, but he was also a cautionary tale because I think I learned by the time the book hit, I realized I don't want to end up like Hunter Thompson either. You know, I'm not going to go out there. And, and play that, I'm not going to play the bad boy chef, you know, and get paid for it. I'm just, you know, mm. you'll notice a number, the most perverse thing I've been able to do the last few years I'm very proud of is done a couple of really fuzzy, warm, family-friendly shows. And I said, boy, that'll really stick it to my fans. You know? <laughs> <laughs> They'll be so disappointed. <laughs> yeah. Um, you've also eaten some very strange things in your life. And I don't want to say, okay, what's the worst thing you've ever eaten? So instead, I'm going to give you a list Great. of you know, the, some of the nastiest Quick things fire, love that. in the world. Okay. 
and you just tell me if you've had them and if it's relevant what they mm. tasted like because you might have swallowed some you might have spat I don't know okay <laughs> sheep testicles uh, had them delicious uh, good texture much better than beef nuts Good to know. Uh, seal eyeballs. Good uh, when fresh, like uh, like good quality sushi. Uh, mm. In context, it can be a heartwarming family experience. <laughs> <laughs> the beating heart of a giant cobra. Is that? It's a, like an. I've said it's like an angry, over athletic oyster. Uh, mm. uh, is it food or is it some sort of weird boner medicine for anxious <laughs> Asians? I kind of regret it. You uh, regret that. Not much going on there, flavor. You know, what are your expectations of that? You know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's more like a it. weird male bonding. You know, is it medicine or is it food? Kind of a situation. If I wouldn't do it again, it wasn't bad. I mean, it wasn't an unpleasant experience, but it, it you know, poor cobra. Yeah, yeah. Um, the unwashed rectum or anus of a warthog. Okay, uh, it tasted exactly like you would expect it to taste. <laughs> um, yeah, that's what I was but, afraid of. But this was a sheer, a, I knew I was going to be ill. I did get very ill. Oh. I knew it was going to be terrible. It, uh, but this was a tribal situation. I'm a good guest. Yeah. Uh, you I'm are. A tribal, very I'm well in a tribal managed. situation. The whole tribe are looking at me. The chief is handing me the best, most treasured part. It's taken him three days to track this thing. I'm taking one for the team. <laughs> oh, yeah. I am actually polite in such circumstances. Yes. And, uh, you know, I, I do something called the grandma rule. You know, if, if I'm at grandma's house, I will eat what grandma offers, and I will say, yes, grandma, it's delicious. I'll have seconds. I, I passed on the seconds this time, but I, I did my best to soldier through. That was in? Namibia. Namibia. In a Kalahari with the Bushmen. Ah. Um, in Iceland, there's mm. a thing called oh, the, a, a stinking, rotten, fermented rotten, rotten shark. shark. That you can smell from like 10 kilometers. Yeah, it's unspeakably vile. Uh, Gil and I were both, uh, Gil and I were both asked the other day, what's the, the worst thing you've ever tasted? We both agree, that That's is just it. far and away. It's, it is the, the, the reek of ammonia and, and urine, and it's just, it's beyond, it, they handle it with gloves. I mean, they don't even touch the stuff when they serve it to you. Else, oh, yeah. But th yeah. that's mostly the smell, surely. No, the flavor. The taste. It, it, yeah, no, it, unlike durian, for instance, which mm. smells like hell, but to my mind tastes awesome and has some real something going for it, well, something wonderful. Uh, this is tastes just as bad as it smells. And even nice. I don't think I don't I don't think anyone actually likes it. It's a it's a it's a nod to their proud Viking roots and and harder, more austere times when they, this was the only way they could preserve protein during the yeah. the summer months. And I mean, you, you see, they're handling it with gloves, and they they put it in their mouth and they chase it with a big shot of like rocket fuel. You know, how good can it be? Well, you would, yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Well, now I do have to ask you, what's the worst thing apart from all those? Because I have heard I have heard you give a different answer. Well, I mean, would I eat rotten shark before I ate a chicken McNugget? Yeah. Um, I'd feel better about myself eating the rotten shark. Yes, you would. You know, you, I feel compromised in a, a part of a, a, an evil empire when I eat a, a, a McNugget. There's just something, there's something morally wrong about it. And, and it's just, what is it? What part of the chicken does it come from? All those other things we talked about, you knew exactly what they were and where, particularly right. where they had come from. But, and so the thing that scares you the most is the... I'm scared curve. that my daughter, my, the thought of my daughter eating one just mm. fills me with, and liking it, it just fills me with terror. Mm. It's, it is, it, it is, it, so we, we should feed our enemies Chicken McNuggets. <laughs> You know, uh, Osama bin Laden wouldn't have lasted anywhere near this long if, if, if we just, you know, if he just had a, like a regular McNugget diet. He, you know, he, he, Tora Bora, he wouldn't have been able to squeeze his fat ass into a cave. <laughs> we would have seen him from space. <laughs> the drones would have, yeah. yeah. Um, so you, you spend your life traveling around the world now. Do you feel an urgency at the moment to get out to certain countries 
relatively quickly before their street food, their authentic regional food, all the things that you're going for to try uh, while they're still around and before they start turning into chicken McNuggets? I don't know. I, I'm kind of optimistic about yeah. the future of the world. It's one of the things like, you know, the, the Chinese are, are increasingly, you know, buying everything in America and, you know, eating up our, you know, buying all our real estate and certainly all of our debt. Um, you know, and a lot of people are frightened, you know, whether they come over here and, you know, pretty soon they'll, they'll you know, they'll, they'll, they'll be all over the place. Well, we'll be, we'll be eating a lot better, a lot better. Um, so I think the expanding Asian influence, this, this power shift away from the West to the East is probably, is to me, at least for food, it arguably a good thing. I mean, Singapore may be Disneyland with the death penalty, as I think R.W. Apple called it, <laughs> but it is a foodie wonderland, and they figured out they are the nannyest of nanny states, and they've got all of the same concerns you have here about hygiene and zoning, and you know, what if, oh my God, it might hurt you, we better make it illegal. Um, you know, like the cheese situation here, which is so shameful, or the oyster situation here, which is so shameful. Um, but they figured out that you know, the food court in Singapore, to me, is a shining beacon of, of how we could live in a perfect world. You know, so I'm encouraged. The places that I feel I like to rush to, or I'm rushing to before they change, I mean, I'm not sentimental about communism. Uh, I'm not, no big fan of uh, the regime in Cuba, but I sure as hell wanted to see it before it changed. Mm -hmm. And it was indeed, you know, it is indeed something, you know, extraordinary. But, you know, the food scene there, you know, they're not so great. I mean, the people are really, really hungry. I'd like to get to uh, Burma and Myanmar, but uh, I, you know, that's a situation I'm waiting for the government to change. Mm. Uh, I'd like to get to Tehran as soon as possible, but again, uh, you know, not right now. Uh, yeah, exactly. The, um, so you're a bit like a canary, really, that we can send out. Yeah, you know, when I the, keel over, you all world. Over. Yeah, exactly. Don't go there. Don't go there, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but, okay, if you are that canary and you're, note, you're one of the first to note in our food world, um, various changes or drops of temperature or cultural sort of shifts. Mm -hmm. um, what is there anything that your nose is telling you at the moment about? Paris that? is fun again. You nice. know, you can eat really, really well in Paris. You know, 15 years ago they were rude, and uh, particularly to Americans, uh, and uh, it would cost you 40 euros for a bowl of soup at a really good restaurant. You know, and. and you know, spectacularly expensive. Now you could eat a f terrific, world-class Michelin quality meal for 40 euros, 30 euros, 50 euros, and, and they'll even be nice to you. Yeah, in we a love a global setting. financial crisis, don't um, we? But it's these young chefs, the young you know, gastronomy yeah. movement is really exciting. Uh, David Chang is a big influence in Paris. You hear French chefs saying, oh yes, we like this man, uh, David Chang from New York. This was unthinkable uh, 15 years ago that, that you know, any French chef would even acknowledge that Spain existed, much less New York. Um, so that's an exciting place to eat. Uh, you know, certainly uh, I, I see Singapore as a hopeful, culinarily as a hopeful example, as an alternative. You know, that's fast food too. Mm. It's also good food. Um, places that I've been excited, Turkey is amazing. I'd like to see more good Turkish food you know, a wider range of Turkish foods than the usual suspects. Uh, Brazil, Colombia, just in general, go to Colombia, it's awesome. I went to Medellin, which 10 years ago was the worst place on earth, the murder capital of the world, and now it is this really, uh, I, came out, I came out of Colombia like really optimistic about the world. Wow, it's possible to improve a really fucked up place in a short period of time. You know, there's no excuse for inner city Detroit, you know, having been to Medellin. I think, I think the beautiful girl on Modern Family has done an awful lot for Colombian tourism yeah, really. as well. <laughs> but tell me, I mean, they're famous, they, they export all their coffee beans to here, amongst other places. Did you get a decent coffee in Colombia? Yeah, but, but it was the food and the people. I mean, these are inseparable. I love, listen, I love food. I'm guilty of being a food pornographer. I fetishize it. But it is, an, it is only one part of... of of a full life. You know, I, I recently, you know, I married into a large Italian Sardinian family and seeing how they live, their relationship with alcohol and with food and ingredients is really a bit of education. You know, mm -hmm. good food is a, at a, whatever income level is a birthright to them. Gotta have it. 
wine at every, with every meal, uh, you know, must have. But you never see drunk ass Italians staggering around vomiting in the streets. They, they, they see, they do everything in proportion. They understand that it's about good food and good liquor, but also hopefully, you know, you're getting laid on a regular basis and you're having good conversation and there's music somewhere music and always. company and, you know, those are all part of a thing, mm. a life. The reason you like Paris at the moment is, as you said, that next generation of chefs. Are you picking up that this generational change is actually changing all the cities around the world and all the different food cultures, restaurant well, cultures? Well, look how differently, you know, look how, how different the kinds of businesses that are popping up here now. You know, you yeah. see, you know, a lot of these people who are opening up small places or pop-ups or just little, little, you know, uh, you know, stripped to the bone, casual eateries. They're cooking their hearts out with maybe one other cook or a dishwasher. Listen, in the end, of course, they're going to open. They'll give in. They'll, they'll, have, they'll open a 300-seat restaurant, and, and they will have a place in a casino, and they will have a cookbook and a boil-it-a-bag dinner line. Um, you know, Robuchon and, and all the great friends, they, uh, uh, Roger Verger, all of those people started out that way too. But what we're getting is a lot more of them, and, you know, it's just, it's just good times. It's part of a cyclical wave, and uh, we're, 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 we're eating. It's new, certainly new to us in, mm -hmm. in the English-speaking world. So, you know, to my way of thinking, there's never been a better time to cook in the English-speaking world, and there's certainly never been a better time to eat. Mm. The, um, Adrian Gill was talking the other day about the, that most depressing term, fine dining. Um, you know, the chef likes to serve this warm, etc. Um, and he said, in terms of sort of, in this voice of wonderment, and we let them get away with it, which I thought was gorgeous. So as chef hat back on, what do you think of this current restaurant trend towards fusing art and landscape and technology on the plate? It, it depends. I mean, are you, ask yourself before you, start dabbling with what somebody somewhere is calling molecular gastronomy. Am I a genius? Am I Ferran Adria? Am I anywhere near as talented and as visionary and as, and as firmly rooted in a place with as much food culture as, as Catalonia? Or am I, am I just kind of jerking off here? Um, you know, I love Jimi Hendrix. Can I, will I ever play guitar as well as Jimi Hendrix? Because you better. If you're going to mess around with that stuff, my way of feeling is uh, don't, don't try. Find what your own style. A lot of those techniques are going to end up standard practice in the industry. You know, sous vide for mm. sure, um, a few others. Um, I think people misunderstand Adria for sure. But, but, you know, short answer, some of the very worst, most painful meals of my life have been people, talented young chefs who have become over-impressed and over-enthusiastic about a cargo cult version of what they believe to be happening at, at places like El Bulli, and they're just playing out of their depth. But there is an opportunity, surely, for those young chefs to adopt the technology, but then turn it around and use where they are and who they are to create something new. Yeah, I'll come back to Dave Chang, Wiley Dufresne, yeah. and people like that who, you know, they, they cherry pick, hey, that, that looks really interesting. We can make a really delicious dish you know, uh, that, that's actually soulful and reminds people of their childhood, and, but we're using a technique that Ferran Adria developed. You know, mm. nothing, nothing wrong with that. It's what it becomes like an eye-gouging experience. You know, it's a, something hanging on the edge of a, of, a, of a long prong, and it's not very good. You know, if it takes your waiter, you know, 10 minutes to describe the dish and two minutes to eat it. Um, <laughs> is it fun? That's all about it. Is it fun? You know, and is it delicious? If the answer is yes, then I'm for it. Hmm. You've um, recently written, not quite an, an episode, but scenes, but a sort of a stream for an amazing television series called Treme, um, which must be, I mean, your face lights up every time anyone <laughs> says Treme. It must be a thrill. I mean, it's it, a thrill to watch the bloody thing, so it must be a thrill to write for it. I found, I suddenly, I don't know when it happened, but, but I found myself at this weird point in my career where I realized that I, opportunities would pop up to work with really amazing people who I 
you know, really admire or worship it. And, you know, I can actually, you know, just to hang out with some of these people is, is you know, I'm stammering here. So out of the blue, I mean, I, to me, The Wire was the greatest thing ever in the history of television. I mean, there's never been a better use of the television medium, never been a better dramatic series. So to get a call out of the blue from David Simon was just this... Did that happen like devast- that? He yeah. just rang out of the blue. Would you be interested in doing some writing <laughs> for me? It was like, you know, you're a football fan, you're a, whole, you're a little kid, you're a football fan, and David Beckham calls up and says, you know, let's kick the ball around. Uh, I mean, I... I, I you know, I teared up. I hyperventilated. I, I, I would have done it for free. Um, uh, and, and in fact, there are a few things that I'm doing in my life right now where it, you know, it's not about the money. It's, it's really fun. It's the most fun I've ever had writing or doing any kind of work, working with people much smarter than me, these incredibly creative people. It's just, you know, it's like you get invited to join the cool kids. And um, so I am. I'm, I'm doing a graphic novel with a really amazing artist named Langdon Foss and a, a friend of mine named Joel Rose. Because, you know, it's not going to make me rich. It's, I'm doing it because I can and because yeah. it's fun. And I like comics. And it's, you know, no. it's cool. You, um, and you've set up your own TV production company for well, your own TV I, I'm partners in a production company that I started with uh, or the, the camera people on my first series of Cook's Tour and I all quit Food Network at the same time because we set up a show with Ferran Adria and the network was not interested. So they were like, who is this guy? He talks funny. He's from Spain. It's too smart for us. We're not interested. Mm. So we, we all reached our own pot. We, we figured, well, we've set this up. We're getting this. This is history here. We have incredible, amazing, once-in-a-lifetime access. We're getting this show. Mm -hmm. We had no customer, no money. We just reached in our own pockets, went out and shot a documentary about the experience. And that was the beginning of this entity that then, that continues to create uh, no reservations, the same same group of people. So really, we owe it all to Ferran. You know, if he hadn't said, you know, yes, uh, I invite you to come into my life and, 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 and film it. Uh, I might be riding a pony from barbecue, you know, competitions to barbecue competitions on Food Network. <laughs> no. Bringing out a <laughs> no, line of happen. burgers or something. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we look forward to, to that, the Bourdain burger line. <laughs> yeah. Not in this <laughs> Not going to happen. No. Um, it's time for questions from the audience. I hope you've got some good ones. There are microphones that you... If you have a question, run to a microphone. Can we see where they are, please? They're on the side. In the meantime, if, you have, if you're up here, you shout it out. I'll, re- I'll yeah, repeat or if it. Yeah, if you're in the middle, just Hand stand up. Yes. up and we'll try to... Yeah. Can you the show the new... The new El Bulli show. Uh, yeah, we, we went back because El Bulli is closing in, in August forever. And Farhan let us go back and shoot every single course from its very beginnings in prep service. We shot me and him and Jose Andres eating every course, uh, staff meal. Uh, we shot all of the animations and graphics and plans and blueprints for, for what comes next in that space, the mysterious El Bulli Foundation think tank. Um, yes, historically speaking, because of the access he gave us and the things he let us see and just because Spain is Spain, I think it's probably going to be the most awesome thing we've ever put on tape. Yeah. Where do we go to see it? It'll be an uh, episode of No Reservations. Fantastic. Uh, this one. Thank you. Um, when you said that you were bored with um, truffles, that uh, made me quite sad. And um, with uh, many people here, I'm sure. Um, with a view to recalibrating uh, your perspective on food, um, would you be interested in coming to a barbecue? I'm going to one now. <laughs> 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 What an offer. <laughs> we won't make you cook, I promise. <laughs> I, I wish I could. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Okay. You eat a lot of food, Anthony. How are you not obese? Um, it's, I'm one of those... I'm one of those, I was one of those really annoying people who could eat and drink with, with wild abandon and not give a shit and never, ever gain weight till about 10, 12 years ago. Uh, and then, you know, it started, that started to change. It's something I have to think about. But I'm, I don't eat breakfast. I don't waste real estate on, you know, you only have so much real estate in your life, <laughs> in your stomach. I don't eat the breadsticks at the table. I'm not eating bread. I don't, 
I'm not snacking. I'm not laying around on the couch eating uh, crisps or, or Cheetos or something like that. Uh, I think if you only eat what's good and, you know, you actually get out of the chair once in a while, that, that, <laughs> that, that helps. Uh, but I do eat strategically. If I know I'm eating a 10-course Chinese meal on camera tomorrow at noon, I'm not eating a big dinner tonight, you know? Um, and I'm certainly going light on the potatoes. And I'm also a guy who really doesn't give a shit about dessert or sweet stuff. I, I don't. I could live the rest of my life without sweet stuff. Uh, I'm all about savory, salty, spicy, yay, forky. Yay. What about cheese, though? Chili is that I cannot live without. That cheese. I, cheese. Cheese. Oh, that I need. Yeah. That I need a lot of. Yeah. But good cheese. Cheese is the new if dessert. It's, if it's not good cheese, that, 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 there's perfect, you know, is this good cheese? Mm. If it's not, there's no point. Mm. You know, is it some just magically reeking thing at the perfect point of ripeness? I'm all over that, man. <laughs> and chilies, obviously. Chilies, that's uh, an addiction, you know. Uh -huh. it's, uh, that, the, the pleasure-pain ratio, you know, I've, I've talked about this. I never really understood sadomasochism. The idea of being spanked by anyone is completely alien to me. Until I went to Sichuan province, where I, you see customers at those uh, Sichuan hot pot restaurants doubled over in agony, <laughs> mopping their faces, you know, saying, oh, I go to, these are locals. Oh, you're so sick. Tomorrow, so sick, so sick. And they're eating and eating. <laughs> <laughs> and loving it. And yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. I think we can start here again. Um, you just mentioned that how much you love cheese, and you were saying before it's a shame that we don't have a wide variety here. No, no, no. You have a wide variety, oh, but you insist on forcing your artisanal cheese makers on you. On, you know, you do not allow raw milk cheeses. Uh, your aging and processing and handling rules are really restrictive and have put out of business or, or restrained some really amazing cheesemakers and cheese visionaries. Are these Richard Thomas? Is that his name? Yeah. Who, you know, he should be your walking Buddha in all matters <laughs> cheese. Yep. And unfortunately... We are working on it, yeah. on the pasteurisation thing. I was wondering what you thought of food as a whole in Australia or where you've been. What, what do you think of the quality of food and the variety? It's been very high since I first came here in uh, about 10 years ago. It was great. It's even better now. Uh, just, you know, quickly, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that, that the, the worst thing that I've seen here that filled me with rage. I was at the fish market and you had these beautiful, beautiful, some of the world's best oysters and they're rinsing them. I mean, I wanted to leap across the counter and say, stop, stop. One of the best things I've seen here was at Victor Churchill's butcher shop. Yay. Oh, wow. Uh, you know, the, the, just mind boggling. What a force for good in this world to see a, a space that beautiful, meet that amazing, and sh sh to the, the love and respect for old school charcuterie traditions and cured meat traditions. I mean, it was Boudin Noir made on premises. It was mind-bogglingly awesome. Fabulous. Um, we lost three minutes through technical difficulties, so I'm taking it back. We're going on. Um, where am I? Anthony, you touched on um, the likes of the raw cheese and raw milk. I would like to know what your opinions are on these, uh, and also the likes of the traditional foods that you talked about. Um, you, you'd stated that the likes of um, washing the oysters is uh, was it, it's a malpractice. Yeah, but um, it's a sin again. If there is a God, it it's is. a sin against God. <laughs> <laughs> and, you, and you also just touched upon uh, Victor Churchill's butchery. Yeah. Um, a lot, a lot of people like myself now are, are going to the likes of farmers. Um, farmers that allow their cattle to, to graze on grass. Um, people don't realise when they go to restaurants that you may say grain fed, but should cattle be really eating grain? Listen, in fact, it should be munching I'm, grass. I'm not, your, I'm not a more, I was a chef. I was in the pleasure business. I wanted to be good. I wanted to be the delicious. I never felt any obligation to serve you that was moral or cruelty free or organic or anything else. I just wanted, I mean, those are concerns. It's nice. I like the, all of our alternatives. Uh, that you know, people are thinking about organics and, 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 and are more aware of where their food's coming from. But ultimately, I don't really care. Is it the most delicious goddamn steak is what I want to know. Mm. Yeah. Um, I don't think the government owes you an absolute guarantee of 100% cleanliness and safety in everything you put in your mouth. Who has ever had that guarantee in the world before? Why should we ask for it now? I would like to know if you're putting, you know, uh, feces or radioactive material in my hamburger meat 
um, please include that in the ingredient list. <laughs> but I, 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 I think you spin the wheel a little bit, certainly you do when you travel, and I think it's perfectly appropriate to make personal and inf hopefully informed decisions about your food. One of the good things about people with concerns about how their cattle is raised or fed or how they live is that you, you increasingly have those options, and that is surely a good thing for chefs and for diners. Yep, brilliant. One last question up there. Thank you. Um, it, uh, you, you just touched on this, but it seems like the, the farm to table and the locavore movement is, uh, is a really big deal, um, and, and also the influence of, of, of Adria coming out of Spain. So what, what do you see as the, uh, as the directions that food are, food are taking? Is that going to be a real sea change in the restaurant no. world, or is it, a, or is it going it is a, way? It is an annoying cuisine? trend by, for, for, the, for the consumption of overprivileged white people. <laughs> okay? Who, Wiley Dufresne said it. What does this even mean, farm to table? Where the fuck else am I buying my food? <laughs> Table, where else am I serving it? Do I need to make people feel bad about their food choices because I'm farm to table? Do I need a t-shirt or a tattoo announcing this? Uh, I know what it means. It means it's gonna be more expensive if I use those words. <laughs> you know, let's just be smart about food. Let's just, to the extent that we know where our food comes from, how it is prepared, and make informed decisions on that, Great. Who doesn't want to support farmers, small farmers? Who doesn't want healthier food supply? Who wants to torture animals and, and crowd them into a, a painful and unhealthy condition? They taste provably less delicious if you do that. Um, but I think this farm-to-table thing is more marketing than reality, and it, it, it's, get, it's reaching a point of an, a, an annoying. I mean, it's a way of separating ourselves from people who don't have the options to go for a $6 bunch of grapes more often than not. And I, I, I think snobbery is the, the, the end of good eating, you know, that... Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Anthony, you haven't been obnoxious. <laughs> yeah. You haven't been particularly arrogant. You have been very wise, very... Yeah, sorry. Jeez, I hate nice. being accused of that. <laughs> um, intelligent. Uh, inspiring, uh, honest. You're making me uh, really uncomfortable. I know, I love this. This is great. This is my opportunity. This is my punishment. I'll <laughs> get back at you. Um, but no, and you've uh, opened a couple of doors for us as well, just to get a little bit of insight into what you do and why. And for all those things, I thank you. You have been grilled. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.